Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization. Our new series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. My name is Andy Ho. I'm a French to English translator, and I'm being joined today by Abigail Dahlberg, a German to English translator and copywriter who specializes in, in environmental issues, primarily recycling and waste management. After completing an MA in translation in 2001, Abigail worked as a staff translator in Germany before relocating to Kansas City and launching a freelance business in 2005. Over the past 15 years, Abigail has helped dozens of direct clients in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland communicate with an English-speaking audience via her business, Greener Words. You can learn more about her at her website, www.greenerwords.com. Welcome, Abigail. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Andy. I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks for interviewing me. So let's start off with your background. Can you tell us about it and how you started translating for the industries that you do? Yeah. So I took a fairly traditional um, route into translation. Uh, I was one of those strange kids that kind of knew when they were 10 or 11 what they wanted to do. And for me, it was translation. And so I just went about finding um, a program that I felt like I could really explore languages, but also a program that I felt was really practical. A lot of the translation programs back then were focused more on literary translation and theory. And I knew I just wanted to get kind of hands-on stuff. So I have a degree in translation and interpreting. And then when I graduated, I moved to Germany and had one of those really strange cases of happenstance where I was, um, I moved to the Black Forest region and um, just applied for any in-house position that I could find within a 50 mile radius. Because I knew after my degree in translation that I had like a solid foundation, but what I really needed was like hands-on practical experience. Um, And I ended up getting um, an in-house position that was kind of like a hybrid role at um, one of the leading German trade journals for recycling and waste management. And so my role had two parts. Uh, the first was you know, pure translation where I would translate articles written by my colleague um, in German into English. And uh, she would proofread those for me with a, a red pen. And uh, I learned a lot, <laughs> a lot and was humbled a lot in that process. And then the other part um, was working as a journalist. So. I also wrote my own articles based on press releases, but also went to conferences and trade fairs um, and toured various recycling facilities just to kind of see how the technology worked. Um, And then I moved to the States in 2005. And funnily enough, there aren't really that many similar positions here in the Midwest. So I just decided to set up my own shingle and do my own thing. yeah, I've been doing that for now for, gosh, 15, 16 years. Um, my main specialties are, as you said, recycling and waste management. I also do a lot of water and wastewater treatment. Um, and lately, I've been really getting involved in translating sustainability reports. There, like I've found that they're kind of my happy spot of combining technical translation and the knowledge that you need to know with um with good writing skills and, you know, they, they're just really fun for me to translate. So I'm really enjoying translating those right now. So you started off translating waste management and environmental things, and you just have stuck with it all this time and, and even branched out a little? 
Yeah, so um, I think my first ATA conference, somebody called me trash girl and it kind of stuck since then. Um, I, I just decided that scenes as how I already had all of this knowledge of the industry, it didn't make much sense for me to um, just discard all of that. And so I was very lucky in the, the in-house um, position kept me on. Um, starting out as a remote worker for them and gradually reduced my hours over time. I still work for them on a freelance basis, but that kind of gave me a buffer to build up my business. Um, and word of mouth has just been a really great marketing tool for me, um, especially at conferences. Like a few years back, I did a, a breakdown of where my revenue comes from. And I worked out that I think something like 40 to 50% of my income um, so my gross revenue comes from referrals from other translators or my current clients. So, um, yeah, I've just been really fortunate. I've had some really great breaks and um, some really good referrals that um, have turned into long term customers that I've been working for for 10 plus years now. Wow. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I really am. I genuinely get excited to get up and get to my desk every day and I know that there's a lot of people that don't have that luxury to really enjoy what they do so I don't take it for granted at all. So if uh, another translator wanted to follow in your footsteps would they need any specific background in order to specialize in what you do? Um, So one of the things about working in environmental issues is that there's really I would say almost like a low bar to get into the field itself. Um, I think when you're talking about medical and legal translation, especially, and, and to some extent, technical translation, you're going to find um, that you're competing or working alongside translators that have a background in those fields. And in some cases are lawyers or doctors or um I don't know, just um, they've, they've, they've had a previous career in those fields. Um, where sustainability issues, um, it definitely helps to have some kinds of qualifications because that's what direct clients are looking for. But um, yeah, I think it, it, it depends to a certain degree what facet of sustainability you do specialize in. Um, but I would definitely think, say that the two main areas to focus on are your writing skills in the target language. So in my case, English, and then just having a really, really deep in-depth knowledge of environmental issues. And I think the thing that I'm seeing a lot right now is that um, something that's really great is that people are more and more aware of um, sustainability issues and how important it is that we all take action to um, try and protect our planet and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and um, similar steps. And so that's great. And I think that there are more and more translators that are now coming into the field that have that interest already. Um, so I would just encourage those people to get some real qualifications in some courses if they can if they can get a second degree in environmental science or related fields, that's definitely gonna help stand out. What are some of the typical translation assignments that you work on and who are your typical clients? Um, well, I think one of the things I really genuinely like about this job is that even though I work in what's really kind of a narrow niche, I translate all kinds of things all over the place. So um, I do a lot of work for publishers, so trade journals and um, consulting firms are some of my biggest clients. I also work for government agencies um, that focus on international development side of waste management and recycling issues. So, for instance, they would, um, I don't know, go out into countries in sub-Saharan Africa or Asia where they don't have um, really great collection systems in place for waste or there's a lot of dumping and figure out what it would take for those um, communities to set up sound waste management infrastructure. And then they write those reports in German and I translate them into English so that they can get funding to make those projects happen. So that's really kind of some of my favorite work to do. I also am a copywriter. And so um, I work for one of Germany's biggest recyclers um, writing their um, international newsletter which is really fun because you get to see what, what different elements of their company are doing all over the globe. And um, yeah, so recyclers, I also work for 
another company doing its contracts. So it's really a little bit all over the place. I would say that um, my work most recently has tended to shift more towards the like the soft side rather than technical translation. I really enjoy writing. And so any job where I can kind of be creative and really add value is um, something that I'm really, really interested in right now. So you said that sustainability is really a growing field right now. How do you keep up with all the changes in the industry and stay on top of all the new developments? That's a really great question. Um, a lot of reading, which is actually something I really enjoy to start off with, so it's no real, um, no real problem for me to do that. But um, what I would say is trade journals. Um, I'm pretty active on, on Twitter following all of the big companies in my field so I can keep an eye on what the latest developments are. And also, um, I take a lot of courses. Like this past year, I just became... Um, I got GRI certification, which is the certification most commonly used for people writing sustainability reports. Um, and I really enjoyed that because I learned kind of the nitty gritty and the details behind sustainability reports writing. And that I think is gonna help me going forward as I translate as well. It helps me kind of anticipate what I'm gonna come across. So yeah, just keeping um, an eye out for any kind of um, continuing education that you can do that you think will further your career as well is never a bad move at all. So in that same vein, uh, in general, not just in, in the field of environmental issues, what other types of skills do you think translators need if they're going to be highly specialized like you? Um, I think they will definitely need to be reading as much as they can, attending trade events. One of the perhaps few upsides of the pandemic is that a lot of events are now online. And so I've been able to attend um, sustainability conferences and recycling events that, you know, take place in Germany and Austria and Switzerland that I normally would have never been able to attend. And I've been able to do a bit more um, networking during those events than there's led to at least one job that I know of. So, um, yeah, I think it's just really making sure that your name is out there and that people know that you do this one kind of niche thing and that if, if they need a translation in that one specific area that you're the go-to person. Um, so, yeah, just, being, just having a really good reputation and doing what you can to help other people, I think, is never a bad idea. Um, just trying to share what you do know and um, just also just showing your skills so that um, anybody that come across as you that comes across you that's perhaps looking for um, a translator and hasn't really had an experience working with translators at all um, can immediately see that you understand their industry, that um, you're kind of an insider, I think is always going to help you get you know um, a leg up in the industry. Now, you've already talked about how you do waste management and sustainability and environmental issues and apparently copywriting for all of these industries. Have you ever, do you intend to continue broadening uh, your offerings, your fields? I, um, that's a good question. I, I feel like I have been broadening more. I think I went the opposite way to the way that a lot of people do, which is to become more, have more and more of a niche. Um, I think I've, I started with a niche and I've kind of broadened into areas that I enjoy. So it started with waste management and then it got into wastewater management and then it got into water treatment. And then from there, I, for instance, was involved in a really big project about dam rehabilitation um, that my kids like famously referred to as the dam dam project for a long time. Um, and then sustainability reports has also kind of been a natural segue. So I'm not really sure. I think I'm just going to kind of see where things take me. I feel like as long as I am working on projects that I'm really passionate about and that I enjoy and that um, use the knowledge that I already have in those fields, that, um, yeah, I think those are all good things. I think you're right when you said earlier that not everybody has the luxury of enjoying what they do so mm -hmm. much. I have to ask though, is there anything you don't like about what you do, about your specialization? Ooh, um, well, there's some things like sometimes I'm translating about sewage before 9 a.m. and that's really, you know, doesn't help with the breakfast. But <laughs> on a serious note, 
Um, I think one of the, the challenges that I've come across is that people that are working in this field don't necessarily have the large budgets that perhaps other fields do because a lot of people are passionate about environmental issues and so you'll find a lot of not-for-profit organizations and people that are doing things as kind of passion projects that don't necessarily have the the budget to pay um, what other projects might pay so I've really had to take a step back and look and think specifically about who would have the budgets to um, provide projects that would keep me going as a translator and then also leave some free time for me to do those projects that I feel strongly about and would like to support by doing pro bono translations and the like. Um, but yeah, it's the other thing about working in the environment is it can get really, really depressing sometimes. Like I had a stretch last a few months ago when um just the everything was going to to part in the environment there was we had um air quality warnings here there were forest fires out west um some people that i knew got caught up in the the severe flooding in germany and it just felt like really hopeless for a little bit um and i ended up just taking a little break um from social media and just kind of pulling back um to help me like focus on what i could change um and i think that's also important is that when we're thinking about environmental issues like we can all do something that's kind of little maybe a small step um and sometimes we don't see the the value of those small steps but if we just all do a little bit then maybe we'll we'll bring some change about here all right well to balance out the bad news i'll, I'll ask uh, what is your favorite part of specializing in sustainability Oh, it's great. It's so much fun. I um, I sometimes tell people I just get paid to learn every day. I am just always astounded by how much variety our environment has in it. You're just learning about different parts of the world and how their environment is and how it's different from ours. Um, and I just genuinely enjoy working in a field where I feel like I'm having some kind of hopefully a positive impact on the lives of other people. I feel like the translations that I do, a lot of them do get read and do have an impact. Um, so yeah, that's just, it's, it's rewarding. And um, it's just, it's a lot of people that are very passionate about what they do. So it's just fun to work along that side, those people and help them kind of share their message with the international community. So I really genuinely do enjoy that part of it. Here's a question that's never far from a lot of translators' minds. Um, has machine translation disrupted sustainability at all? I mean, you've been in the industry now long enough to see any potential changes in it. Um, I think some, some texts kind of on the technical side may have gone that way. I, I know I did lose a couple of clients that, um, that decided to switch to a machine translation solution. Um, and that's kind of also driven my, my move into copywriting. I just took some time a while back to think about what can machine translation not do? And I think machine translation really has a hard time conveying emotion and adding value and being persuasive. And so those are kind of the texts that I'm increasingly interested in is um, the kind of texts where you can just sit back, take a little bit of time with it and really create something that's um, really appealing to the reader. Not something that's just fast and quickly done, just something where people really value the, the image and their reputation um, and want to make sure they get their messaging right. So I've just kind of switched more to that side of it lately. All right, final question. Is there anything else that you want to tell translators who are thinking about specializing in sustainability? Um, I would say go for it. But one thing to really think about is what kind of niche you can move into within the sustainability field. It's a really broad field, so it's important to have one or more sub niches. And when you're trying to come up with a sub niche, it's also really important to think about the languages you're working with. So for instance, if you are a French translator, I would definitely be looking at things along the lines of wastewater treatment, water recycling, desalination, just because um, in, in various parts of Africa, that's going to be an increasingly important issue. Um, so think about combining not only the, the 
field that you're interested in, but also the geography of the countries where your source languages are spoken and what might be a hot topic there. So for me, recycling is a really good fit because Germany and Austria and Switzerland are really pioneering recycling technology. So maybe just think about other areas that might be growth areas in the future, um, things like carbon storage technology, um, renewables is gonna be increasingly interesting, I think, going forward. So yeah, just kind of keep, make sure you have your pulse on the, on the your fingers on the pulse of the, the field and know what's going on in your country and where there might be potential for translators to move in and help those companies make their message um, spread beyond their borders. Well, thank you for your time, Abigail. Our listeners, uh, I'm sure will find your advice and insights very helpful and inspiring. Thank you, Andy. Well, thanks for all the good, great questions. And uh, full disclosure to our audience, Abigail was my mentor in the ACP Mentor Mentee <laughs> Program. Uh, if it isn't evident already from the interview how smart she is, I can fully <laughs> attest to uh, her expertise. Thank you, Andy. You were my first and one of my favorite mentees. So I'm, oh, I've just been delighted to watch your progress over the years. And I know that there's more great stuff to come down the pipeline. All right. Well, thanks, Abigail. <laughs> thanks, Andy. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our new series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. Mary David and Rashan Pacarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.